Welcome to the Department of Renewable Resources Seminar Series for March 22, 2012. Our speaker today is Dr. Bridget Stutchbury, Canada Research Chair in Ecology and Conservation Biology and Professor at York University. Today she will be speaking to us about conserving long-distance migratory songbirds, linking breeding and wintering populations. Thanks. It's a pleasure to speak to you today. I've been studying migratory songbirds uh, since the mid-1980s, and my own career has undergone an evolution over this time from beginning with what I call the fun question, studying uh, bird behavior, mating systems, territoriality, to the perhaps more depressing issues of songbird declines and, and conservation in light of multiple stressors uh, affecting these beautiful birds. And what I'm going to focus on in today's talk is trying to link uh, breeding populations with wintering populations and explaining to you why this is, has been so difficult to do, why it's so important to do, and then using two of my recent studies, using different models of migratory songbirds, to show you what our, our latest results are. And so this, is a, this a map here shows the basic problem that we have. Uh, this uh, could be, I, I didn't put a picture of the bird here on purpose because I want you to think more generically in terms of the problems of uh, conserving migratory animals, not just birds, migratory animals. And so, for instance, you can have a large breeding range up here, and if this was a resident species that did not migrate, say, out of the boreal, you would still have huge challenges in conserving such a widespread species and understanding its conservation needs and all the multiple stressors that are occurring um, across its Canadian range. But when we're dealing with a migratory species, we have a whole new set of problems. Uh, first of all, there's a wintering area. This particular species, Wilson's warbler, but it doesn't matter which one, uh, for instance, has a wintering area in Central America. So this bird would spend four months of the year, maybe, on its breeding grounds, and more like six months of the year in Central America. So if you want to understand population dynamics of a breeding bird, why is, the popu why is some populations going down, why are others going up, we need to also do studies on the wintering grounds and understand how winter survival is affected, for instance, by habitat loss on the wintering grounds. And as if this isn't hard enough, the birds or whatever animal you're studying, of course, have to get back and forth between the breeding and wintering areas. So we also have to know something about their migration corridors or migration routes and what threats they face along the way. So this can be illustrated with a, a simple sort of life cycle like this where our job when we're trying to conserve songbirds or any migratory animal, in this case the songbirds, we have to know what's going on on the breeding grounds in the temperate zone. We have to know what's happening in terms of fall migration and what we call stopover ecology, what happens when the birds stop during migration to refuel, and then also what's happening on the wintering grounds in the tropics. And of course, the population sizes that we monitor on the breeding grounds up here are going to be influenced by mortality that occurs during migration and on the wintering grounds. <coughs> and why is this so important to study? Well, migratory songbirds are among the many groups of animals that fe are featuring really chronic long-term population declines, not of every single species, but in Canada alone, dozens of species of songbirds are showing steep population declines. Uh, here's an example of the wood thrush, an eastern forest bird. You can see these are breeding bird survey data uh, from the 1960s down to more recently very strong decline, almost a 50% reduction in abundance over this period alone. Uh, the bobolink, shown here, is a grassland bird, completely different habitat during breeding and on the wintering ground, and yet another uh, sort of poster bird for grassland bird declines. <coughs> so the, the whole s field of studying migratory songbird declines itself has kind of undergone various transitions over the years. It really came to a head in the early 1990s, and a lot of the focus at that time was on eastern forest songbirds and understanding how habitat fragmentation, forest fragmentation, was impacting the breeding productivity of the songbirds. Much less attention paid to the wintering grounds. And then 
perhaps a decade later, again, the focus kind of not shifted, but expanded to include the decline of grassland birds. So grassland birds became a hot topic, and, and deservedly so, because up to that time, too much emphasis, perhaps, just on understanding forest songbirds. <coughs> so one of the reasons that we need to understand this migratory connectivity is because we want to understand how events on the wintering grounds, we want to be able to predict how events on the wintering grounds are going to impact breeding populations. But up until very recently, our hands have been pretty much tied in doing so because for most species, we had little or no idea what the connectivity was, migratory connectivity between breeding and wintering populations. So I've shown here kind of two contrasting examples of what might be true in nature. And I think you'll see right away what the implications are, depending on what you're doing. This happens to be the breeding range of the wood thrush and the wintering range of the wood thrush. So one scenario might be that individual breeding populations have very predictable wintering regions. So within the winter range, a given breeding population, let's say from the northeast, usually winters in a given area. And so each breeding region has a distinct, perhaps overlapping, but a distinct wintering area. If this were true, it would be called high connectivity, and there are ways of putting a number on it and measuring it. On the other hand, for all we know, species have very low connectivity. And so a given wintering site may draw individuals from across the breeding range. So you get complete mixing. And why is this so important in terms of managing and uh, developing policy for saving these songbirds? Well, obviously, under this kind of scenario, we can map out winter habitat loss in one area and predict how that's going to affect a breeding area. So if you were to have heavy deforestation in one of these countries, like Honduras or Nicaragua, which have undergone extensive deforestation in the last 20 years, now we know where to go and look to see what those effects are. Specific breeding regions will be affected by deforestation in specific areas. But if you have this kind of scenario, deforestation in one site is going to have a diffuse spread out effect over the entire breeding population. You may not even see its signature because it is spread out across the very large breeding range. So we need to know for these species, what's the scenario? How, how can we map these things out? <clears throat> well, the first way to do it with great precision, but also great patience, is using band recoveries. So we've had a bird banding program in place in North America for decades, uh, depending on the banding station. Many of them, like Long Point, go back to the 1960s. And every year, thousands of birds are banded at individual stations. And there are so many dozens of stations across North America that collectively, it adds up over the years. So here's an example of a paper published recently on uh, the catbird showing a uh, distinct connectivity patterns based on band return. So the birds are banded up here in North America, and the bird is actually recovered, dead or alive, down here in the tropics on its wintering grounds. And it's clear what the pattern is. The birds from the northeast here overwinter in Florida and Cuba, and the ones from the Midwest go down here to Guatemala and uh, Belize. So very clear-cut pattern. This is the kind of information we'd like to have on all our birds. And it's quite precise because you know exactly where the bird was banded and you know exactly where it was caught. The trouble is this took 50 years to produce. 50 years of bird banding to get these data. We don't have time to do that. And there are many species, you'll see an example in a minute, where actually you don't, with all the birds banded on the breeding grounds, you hardly ever get a recovery in the tropics. So even when you get, you know, you can pour through all this, the, the data are all openly available, you can pour through it for your species, hoping for the best, but then it turned out that maybe there's no data. So anyway, band recoveries do a good job for some species. The data is already there for us to go and explore. We don't have to go out and do it all ourselves. It's already there, but um, this worked well for catbirds, but that's a bit unusual. Here's another method of doing it, and this is using feather isotopes. Most people are familiar with this, where the hydrogen isotopes in the feathers uh, leave a signature based on the hydrogen isotopes that come down in the rainfall. 
which go into the insects, which go into the birds. And so there's a latitudinal gradient from south to north in terms of the hydrogen isotopes in the environment. And therefore, for birds that grow their feathers, their new feathers, if they're grown on the breeding grounds, if you go to a wintering area and catch a black-throated blue warbler and take a little sample of feather and then go and analyze it in the lab, it will tell you, roughly speaking, where that feather was grown on a north-south gradient in North America. So it's a nice trick in the sense of being able to map out on the breeding grounds what are the feather isotopes found in the breeding populations, and then you go on a nice two or three month field trip in the winter. Hopefully you don't just send your students, you go yourself and sample black-throated blue warblers throughout their wintering range here in the Caribbean, and then you can figure out where do individual wintering populations come from. And this is a, a really interesting example where, in this case, the breeding range of the black-throated blue warbler has a north-south gradient on it, and the southern populations, which are identifiable by their distinct feather isotopes, turn out to overwinter in Puerto Rico and Hispaniola, whereas the birds that are in Cuba come from the northern part of the breeding range. So it kind of crosses over. Uh, that's really important conservation-wise, because if you get extreme habitat loss in Hispaniola, and the left side of this island is completely denuded, for instance, we know now that it's going to be these breeding populations that are impacted from that deforestation. We shouldn't go to Ontario to look for a habitat loss effect in Hispaniola. You're not going to see it there. So feather isotopes are great because you can get tons of data in a very short period of time. However, the geographic resolution is kind of coarse. Okay, you can't pinpoint where your bird comes from. You can, you can uh, bin it, so to speak, on a north-south gradient. But for instance, these birds in Cuba, you don't necessarily know, just from the hydrogen isotopes, whether your bird is from New Brunswick or over here in Michigan, right? because it's stretched out on an east-west line. You need other chemicals or cues to try to get that east-west gradient. And even then, you're talking, like, just roughly speaking, where is that bird from? But it does a good job in the sense of getting you the data you want rather quickly. <clears throat> well, what I'm going to talk about today is a new method for measuring connectivity. And this is through actually tracking the birds themselves. So a few years ago, we worked with the British Antarctic Survey to miniaturize geolocators and put a light stock on them so that you could put them on the bird's back. Because up until that point, they'd been putting them on shorebirds and seabirds where the geolocator is attached to the bird's leg, onto the leg band. But we wanted it up on the bird's back because that's how we track songbirds. <clears throat> and so this shows, uh, the, this, this is a one and a half gram geolocator with a light stock, the light sensors at the end. And these things um, archive the light data. So every 10 minutes, it'll record the light data and record that 24-7, week after week, month after month, for up to three years for one this size. Uh, and the, so it's a, we put it on the bird's back. It goes off wherever. The bird comes back to its, its territory the next year after migrating. You catch the bird. You get the geolocator back. You plug it into your computer. And as long as the battery's working, you download the data, and within an hour, you've got your migration map. So it's kind of neat. <clears throat> the catch, though, there are a couple catches. One is this bird has to come back with its geolocator for you to get any data at all. Uh, sometimes there are cases where the bird comes back and you can't catch it, which is very frustrating. Other cases where the, you get the geolocator, but the battery's dead, which is equally frustrating, or perhaps almost equally frustrating. But when you download the data, if it works, this is what the raw data look like. It's just measuring light levels. So for instance, this shows a sunset. This is nighttime, that's a sunrise. This is daytime, that's a sunset, that's nighttime. And it's got a clock on board, and so it knows the date and time. And if you were to go and look up Greenwich Mean Time, this date, I think it's the 4th of May, 2007, and look at the sunrise and sunset times, you could tell me where this geolocator was without any hints. You could do it. You could go. You could do. It. If this was an undergraduate class, it'd say, "Okay, get on your computers. Go do it. Tell me where it was. Use your clickers." Um, Toronto. But I mean, uh, it doesn't really matter where it was. The principle is that you would be able to figure it out from the raw data and no other information whatsoever. 
So this is the kind of thing we can do now with, uh, we're working with some of the larger songbirds because these geolocators are still on the, a little bit on the big side, one to one and a half grams. They're getting them smaller and smaller. 0.6 grams is the smallest one, which means you can put it on a 25 gram bird, for instance. But this is the kind of thing that we can get now. And you can see how different it is from the band return data and from the stable isotope data. So this particular bird, you can see the geolocator on its back here. We, we've switched to using shorter stalks. This is the, the first generation one, but you can see the thing sticking up on its back. Uh, this bird left our, our study site is in northwestern Pennsylvania. You know, it's only a few hours drive from York, so it's a handy study site. And we know that it left sometime in September, um, went down to the, the coast here, uh, came down through Florida, hopped across to Cuba, and then overwintered in northern Honduras here. So we know the route, we know the stopovers approximately. You can't get that any other way than by tracking. And then we can map out its winter territory because these guys, I mentioned, they're territorial on, the, on their wintering ground, so a bird will stay in the same place all winter. So although there are some days that you have to throw out because it was so rainy you get a, a, a ridiculous you know, uh, location because it looks as though the sun came up two hours later than it really did. You're in a tropical rainforest and it's pouring rain. Sometimes the geolocator gives you uh, an outlier. You just have to throw it out. Uh, that, and that's what these bars are meant to show here. This is the um, one standard deviation in terms of the latitude, the average latitude over the winter period, and the longitude. So you can see these things uh, are pretty sketchy in terms of measuring latitude, but when you take the average over the whole winter period, you get a position that's quite plausible. And we know that the, this is part of the winter range. There's lots of nice forest, uh, lowland forest along the coast there. The longitudes are a bit more accurate because the longitude is based on a single sunrise or sunset, whereas latitude is based on day length, which means you need a sunrise and a sunset, so you're automatically going to double your error, right? And there's other reasons for it too, but never mind. Spring migration for the same bird, so this was its wintering area. We know when it got to its winter territory, we know when it left. It comes up to the Yucatan, crosses the Gulf of Mexico, and comes up the Mississippi Flyway back to its territory by the 3rd of May. So we know that it took two weeks to get home. We know the route. We know the stopover locations. This is all stuff that, that we couldn't have got with these other methods. So geolocators, their precision is not as good as a band return exact point. But like stable isotopes, you can get a whole lot of data in just a few years and, and arrive at your answer fairly quickly for any bird that can carry these things. <coughs> so the key questions that we're looking at, and I've mentioned these before, how extensively do breeding populations mix on the wintering grounds? That's a fundamental question that we need to know for migratory birds and for other migratory species too. And then what we're working on now is once you know this, what are the implications for this connectivity pattern for conservation, for understanding how habitat winter loss is going to predict uh, breeding population declines? So um, as you mentioned, we're, we've done this on two different species, the wood thrush, a forest bird that overwinters in the tropical forests of Central America, and also for the purple martin, uh, a l fairly large swallow, which is a nest box bird, and uh, that one overwinters in Brazil. So we've got two different migratory birds with different ecological niches and different migration capabilities and distances, so we can sort of look for commonalities and differences between the species as well. So we'll start with a wood thrush one, and uh, mo most of the talk will actually be on, on wood thrush. And when I was mentioning before how difficult it can be to get these kinds of data from band returns, the wood thrush is a good example. So you email the U.S. Bird Banding Lab in, in Patuxent, Maryland. You ask them for the wood thrush file. They email it back within a couple of days. <clears throat> and you'll discover that, uh, roughly speaking, about 36,000 wood thrush have been banded since these banding programs began. Some of the records are really old, but pretty much since the 1960s. Uh, so about a 50-year period, we've had banded 36,000 wood thrush. Uh, 408 of those birds were subsequently seen again, and that's typical, about a 1% uh, recovery rate, that's typical. There's a lot you can learn from banding, besides, you're not just banding to get uh, recoveries, but uh, there's 408 recoveries to work with. You go, great, what I want is 
a bird banded during the breeding season, which is June, July, and recovered in the tropics during the winter season, December, January, February. Not one. Not one. It's not one. There's four sort ofs, which we're, which we're going to include. These cases I include because, for instance, here's an example where the bird was banded uh, near Chicago on the 2nd of October. That's migration, right? So it's not June and July breeding. So technically, no, that's not a good one. It was recovered down here in Guatemala during the wintering season. So we're confident that it overwintered in Guatemala, but we know the winter range, the limit of the breeding range is up here. You might not be able to see it. So although it was migrating through Chicago, it couldn't have come from much farther away. So we can include this sort of one. Same with one over here. This one here was banded in Costa Rica the 6th of April and recovered the 6th of May in Connecticut. The 6th of May is still spring migration. It probably kept going. It might have bred in Connecticut. We just don't know. But again, the breeding range doesn't go much farther north. So it still tells us something about connectivity. It couldn't have gone much farther. So th this is an example where the banding thing just doesn't work for wood thrush in particular. So we've been deploying geolocators uh, on different sites on the breeding grounds and different sites on the wintering grounds. So if you think of it this way, for the breeding grounds, you put the geolocators on the breeding grounds and you're tracking them to their unknown wintering site and then they come back to their, their breeding site. You can do it the other way around. You deploy on the wintering grounds, the birds go to their unknown breeding area and then come back to their wintering site. So we're trying to do the connectivity map from both directions. And uh, here's a picture of my student, Garth, uh, who was down in Nicaragua in early December training a banding station that has been going on for years down there. They're training our collaborators on how to put geolocators on wood thrush. And here's a picture of a wood thrush with a, a newly tagged wood thrush. This geolocator kind of looks like, stands out like a sore thumb when you first put them on. But uh, if you were to recapture a bird uh, a day or two later, you'd find that the feathers cover this whole thing right here wouldn't be obvious at all. And in fact, my students find it frustrating when they're trying to recapture these birds a year later. It's actually hard to see with your binoculars whether this bird has a tiny little stalk on its back or not. So we're working with collaborators in the tropics, either having my, I've had several students who've worked in uh, Belize and Costa Rica, and then with these collaborators in Nicaragua to try to find out where the breeding populations are coming from. So we'll start with the breeding grounds first. Uh, this shows, uh, and, and some of the data are kind of spotty. Most of our data w you know, on breeding ground deployments come from my study site in Pennsylvania. This is where we first started doing it, and this is where we've put the most on so far. Um, but we also have a couple birds that a, co a collaborator track from Vermont, uh, Maryland, and here in western North Carolina. And so you can tell by the colors of the map, it's hard to really get the pattern from this one map alone. But what I want to point out is that these Pennsylvania birds do not scatter across the entire wintering uh, region. They're focused here in northern Honduras, especially northeastern Honduras and uh, Nicaragua. So here's a blow up of that. We have 21 birds that we've tracked from exactly the same breeding population, right? They're neighbors. They hear each other singing all day and they cheat on each other and do all this social behavior. They end up, their wintering sites are all scattered in a very focused area along here. Not in Panama and Costa Rica, not in Belize, not in Guatemala, not in southern Mexico. None of our Pennsylvania birds go there. Go there. So this is uh, telling us that there's actually very, appears to be high connectivity, high predictability that our Pennsylvania birds or northwestern Pennsylvania depends on very specific wintering sites for that breeding population to persist. Um, the North Carolina birds, there are only five that we're able to get from here. You can see they, uh, they're they starting to show up here in the western sites in uh, Mexico and, and western Honduras. So that's a hint that maybe something different is going on with these North Carolina birds. So my, one of my students went and established a study in Belize here to track them from the bottom up. And you can see that these most of these Belize birds indeed come from the southeastern part of the breeding range. Okay. And another student who's working in Costa Rica tracked the birds at La Selva in Costa Rica and found that they come from the northeast. So again, a little bit of overlap between the Belize and Costa Rica breeding grounds, but not as much as you might expect. These sites are really not that far apart, something like 600 kilometers, and yet seem to have distinct 
uh, breeding areas. And again, here's a blow up of the, just the birds wintering at one wintering site at La Selva in Costa Rica, one site. And you can see, you know, so many of them clustered around here in the Finger Lakes region in New York State, upstate New York. This is uh, near Ottawa up in here. A very high concentration of them right here and just a few scattered ones down here. Interestingly, the triangles here are all females. So the triangles are females, the circles are males. And uh, we, we don't know if this is, you know, for real. We need some more data. But the ones that are uh, scattered the farthest out here are all females, which is interesting because in birds, females tend to be the more dispersing sex compared with males. And maybe that's what we're picking up here. But uh, we'll have to see how that develops. So when you put the breeding and wintering maps together, you get a pattern that looks a lot like this. And here I'm uh, sort of conveniently ignoring some of the overlap that we've seen. But the, we get this uh, pattern of, it's a fine scale connectivity pattern. It's high connectivity, and the pattern is parallel leapfrog migration. So by parallel, I mean that the eastern birds stay east and the western birds stay west. And by leapfrog, I mean that the northern birds from the northern part of the breeding range winter in the southernmost part of the wintering range. And the, the level of connectivity is much higher, the one to one matching than we would have expected based on uh, either band return data from other species or isotope data. So it's kind of remarkable in itself that these birds apparently, we don't really know this, but we, we think that these guys are more or less pre-programmed to go to Costa Rica. They're not just sort of finding their way to Costa Rica, but that the young birds that are born there have that destination genetically programmed, which implies some kind of genetic structuring in this population, which has not been described. Typical surveys of mitochondrial DNA and these kinds of birds do not find strong genetic structuring within the population. And yet when you do this kind of mapping, it suggests that there must be some. Uh, so if you plot, for instance, this is just the parallel leapfrog migration. If you plot wintering latitude versus breeding latitude, you get the negative correlation showing that the northern birds overwinter in the farther south. And then this is the parallel part where the wintering longitude is positively correlated with the breeding longitude. Uh, so that just shows on a graph what we saw visually in, in the map. So we have this parallel leapfrog migration. So one question is why leapfrog? What, what are the hypotheses for why we should get this leapfrog pattern? And really the only one that I could come across in the literature is one based on um, competitive exclusion. The idea being that Territory competition, because these birds individually defend territories all winter. It must be, it could occur if uh, the northern breeders are forced to go to the southern areas. So if birds that breed down south migrate first and go to Belize and occupy that habitat, so the southern birds occupy the northern breeding grounds, they kind of go the shortest distance, saving energy, right? The birds from up north, when they get down there, it's all taken. They have no choice but to keep going because the habitat's saturated. And so it's just based on uh, territorial competition. So if this hypothesis was true, we would predict that the southern birds, the southern populations, would in fact migrate earlier. It's the only way it can work. They get there first, they have a competitive advantage. So I've broken our, our, our population down into three uh, regions, the southeast, the central east, and the northeast. And we can look at our geolocator data in terms of uh, on what date does an individual bird first pass into the tropics? Tropics being, you know, so somewhere between Florida and Cuba, right? A dotted line on the uh, on 23.4 degrees north. And if you look at that between the populations, kind of surprisingly, you'll find that the three different breeding regions all enter the tropics at about the same time. The southern birds do not migrate earlier than the northern birds. So here's the northeastern birds. Their peak passage time is sometime around mid-October, but the same is true really for the southern and the central birds. So they, they all show the same pattern. There's no, there's no, apparently, no competitive advantage for these southern birds. So it suggests that a competitive exclusion hypothesis does not explain the leapfrog migration. The other part of the, the hypothesis would predict that, be, that the northern birds would be arriving later on their winter territory. Right? They, they have to go farther, so they should arrive later on their winter territory. And this does actually appear to be true. So if you look at the birds going to Belize, they tend to arrive 
sometime in October, the ones in, that go into Honduras and Nicaragua late October, early November, and the ones that go to Costa Rica are arriving just a little bit later, late October and early uh, November. So maybe a week or two delay for the Costa Rican birds. So you might say, aha, leapfrog, I've explained it. This is why there's, you know, this shows that these birds are getting there later because they can't settle in Belize. But you have to remember the earlier graph. They're all entering the tropics at the same time. Birds from, that are coming from the north could stop in Belize if they wanted to. It's just that they don't. And they don't have all that far to go. Uh, in terms of their entire migration distance, the section that goes from Cuba down to Costa Rica is not a long distance. They've already covered 80% of the journey. And yet they're late getting to the winter territory. So I would argue it's not that they couldn't get there earlier. It's just that they don't. This isn't really a good prediction of the hypothesis. Yes, they arrive late, but it's not because they're leaving Vermont any later. <coughs> so we still haven't really figured out, you know, we're still working on this, why do wood thrush have this leapfrog migration? Is it a behavior for the northern birds that evolve via natural selection? Is there some advantage to them of going to Costa Rica versus Belize? Well, we don't, we don't know yet. So that's still a question mark, why leapfrog? Another explanation for these kind of uh, migratory connectivity patterns is that they're historical. So it's not so much that birds have an advantage in going to one place or another. It's just that they originated from populations that did so. And here's an example that was published uh, just recently on the wheat ear. The wheat ear is a, a small little songbird that is distributed across northern Europe, but some populations have spilled over into eastern Canada and other populations have spilled over into Western Canada. And when they did this geolocator tracking on the wheat ear, they found, not surprisingly, that the Alaskan birds, I know that's not Canada, sorry, the Alaskan birds migrate down here to Eastern Africa, and the birds from Eastern Canada cross the Atlantic and overwinter here. Not because there's some advantage to doing so, but historically, these populations are most closely related to the, the Western Europe populations and these ones to Eastern Europe. So it's just an extension of the migration routes from the, their historical ancestors. So it's possible in wood thrush, possible that these patterns that we're seeing are a result of different migration routes. So they end up in different places because they're pre-programmed to head off in different directions. So we looked at the migration routes and found the case, that the answer was no. That's, that's not the explanation for wood thrush. What this uh, panel shows, again, we've broken the, the birds up into the northeastern group, the central eastern group, and the southeastern group. And the left-hand panels in blue show fall migration, and then in red show spring migration. So we'll just look at fall migration for now because we're interested in the leapfrog pattern and how does that originate and develop. And, it, and as I said, it could be if they all took, if the different regions took different routes, it would take them to different places, right? But no, just like they arrive in the tropics at the same time, they take the same routes. Birds from up here come down the east coast, Florida, Cuba, some of them zip over to the Yucatan and then they end up down here in Costa Rica. The central birds, same thing. Southern birds, a few more crossing the Gulf of Mexico in the fall, but they also take this Florida route. So at least based on this evidence, it, does, it appears that these different regions have overlapping timing, overlapping routes, and yet they end up in different places. So again, we're still question mark. We don't really understand the evolutionary origins of, of this connectivity pattern that we've discovered. But we can look at uh, some of the implications of this for understanding uh, the population declines that we've seen of the wood thrush. And so if we look, try to quantify these connectivity patterns in terms of um, the breeding and wintering site connectivity, which is what I first showed you with the maps, and then the stopover connectivity in terms of the migration routes, you can see the contrast here. So what we've done is to, again, break the birds up into these three different regions in the east. And for the wintering grounds, we can say how many birds from the northeast overwintered in winter region one, which is southern Veracruz, winter region two, Belize, Guatemala, winter region three, Nicaragua, Honduras, and four would be Costa Rica. Okay, so for these winter sites, the northeastern birds, the majority of them go to region four, Costa Rica, which is what I showed you already. <coughs> 
Central eastern birds, the majority of them go to Nicaragua and Honduras, which I showed you before. And then the southeastern birds, the majority of them go to Belize. So you can see this is the strong, predictable connectivity, which I showed you earlier on the map. So we can express that as, you know, the percentage of the population that does this. But if you look at the migration routes, you see the completely overlapping migration routes. So black as a migration route would be region four, Florida and Cuba. Uh, one would be coming around here on the west side of the Gulf. So in fall, you can see that uh, in terms of stopover overlap, they take the same routes, like black, right? It's either Florida and Cuba or three crossing the Gulf right here. In the spring, however, these populations take completely different routes back in the spring. So let me just go back a second and I'll show you this. So in the fall, they come down through here. In the spring, they come back across the Gulf of Mexico, like that one bird that I showed you. Doesn't matter if your birds are going to Vermont, Central America, or Southeast, Central East, or Southeast. They come up to the Yucatan, cross the Gulf of Mexico. They make landfall in the Mississippi Delta, and off they go. So all three populations have heavily overlapping fall and spring migration routes, which makes the entire eastern population of wood thrush highly vulnerable to what's happening in that bottleneck. So if you have extensive habitat loss in the Mississippi Delta here, where stopover habitat is so degraded that birds can't refuel or they suffer high mortality as, as a result, this bottleneck here we would predict is going to impact all the populations. So our prediction is something, or our estimate is something like 80% of all the wood thrush along the eastern part, which is the most abundant part of their range, funnel through this area. And that makes them incredibly vulnerable to any events happening. So if you wanted to target an area for stopover conservation for wood thrush, we know what our top pick would be. What is the one place that's most important? If you had to, could only pick one, what place would you pick for habitat restoration for stopover sites for wood thrush? Well, it would be right here because 80% of the birds come right through that spot, highly vulnerable. So you can see this here in terms of this piece of the pie. This is the uh, Mississippi Delta area. You can see all three populations, about 80% of the individuals come right through that bullseye. The other question that we, that we wanted to look at, and we're still working on, uh, on this issue right now, is trying to predict, now that we know the breeding wintering connectivity, we have that map. This breeding population winters down in this region. We can try to now answer the question, does tropical deforestation in a given region predict the breeding bird survey trends that we observe on the breeding grounds? So we should be able to build a population demographic model that takes into account the breeding ground productivity, survival on the wintering grounds, and then ask the question, uh, just to what extent do they map on? So the breeding bird survey, which has been done since the 1960s, we have really great data, or as good as it gets, both on population trends and relative abundance. So here's a, an example of the population trends of wood thrush in eastern North America. These are color-coded, showing in red where the population is... Uh, uh, this population trend is minus 3% a year or worse. So this is really bad, right? The population is declining by 3% a year or worse. Orange is pretty bad, uh, 2 to 2.9%. Yellow is bad, gray is bad, and green is okay. And you can see but the, this is the reason the wood thrush is in so much trouble. In most of these states, if you go state by state, Almost all the states, there's a significant decline in wood thrush numbers across the board. So they're declining almost everywhere. Uh, where they're doing best is out here in the Midwest and in this central eastern zone. So the central eastern zone, which is what, is what we've been calling it, is where the population declines aren't nearly as bad. And in fact, Ohio, they're actually increasing a little bit. So for some reason, the central east is kind of almost holding its own, almost holding its own. Now we can look at relative abundance. And you can see that although the Midwestern birds are doing okay, they're actually very scarce out there. It's probably because most of the forest is gone. Right? So when you think about forest loss and forest cover, the Midwest is an area where uh, a lot of that forest is gone. So right now, wood thrush are most abundant in this central eastern zone. 
So where they're doing okay is where they're most abundant, and we can have this nice map showing us measures of relative abundance. So we should be able to put this together uh, into a model. And so we're still working on this right now. We just started doing this a couple weeks ago, building a predictive model. Um, but what I'm showing you here is just a visual model for now. It's a network model where we've taken uh, the different breeding nodes, as I call it, the northeast, central east, and southeast, and then I put out here midwest to sort of, I mean, I know that's a huge area, but we haven't tracked the birds yet in the midwest, so we can't really break it down into its smaller categories. So these are the breeding regions, and these are the wintering regions down here, one, two, three, four. And the lines that I've used to connect them represent our estimate of how much of the global wood thrush population moves between that breeding region and that wintering region. So to arrive at those data, we take the relative abundance data, and we take the amount of forest cover that's available, and we estimate, you know, out of all the wood thrush in North America, how many of them are in the Central East. So this, so this circle here is very large because most of the wood thrush, at least half the wood thrush, we think, in, in the entire population, come from the Central East because they're so abundant there. The Northeast, Southeast, and here you have the Midwest, a tiny little circle because there are just not very many wood thrush there to begin with. And so these lines are based on our connectivity data showing where, what percentage of the population moves between different nodes. And down here, we, these boxes represent the amount of forest cover. The, the size of the square is the amount of, of remaining forest cover in these countries. And inside the square is the percent forest loss in the last 20 years. So again, right now this is a visual model, but I think we can uh, get some lessons learned just from studying this a little bit. The breeding population, which is doing fairly well, is declining by only minus 0.8% per year. I mean, that's still bad, but compared to the other ones, it's not so bad. The central eastern population is doing fairly well. Where does it go? It goes to the one place in the tropics that still has the most forest left in Central America. I don't think this is a coincidence, and that's what our model will tell us, is whether there's a cause and effect going on here, at least in terms of simulating it. So one would say, if you see the width of this line, the vast majority, or large percentage anyways, of the global wood thrush population goes from the central east to Honduras, Nicaragua. So again, if you were to pick a wintering region to say, we want to save wood thrush, now which wintering region is most important? First choice. Of course, they're all important, right? We should save everything. But if you can't do that, and you're National Audubon, and you want to set up a program to work with partners in Central America to set aside habitat, or you're going to develop certified shade coffee programs to provide wood thrush with alternate forested habitat. You know, they, they, they like shade coffee farms. If you're going to develop a program, where should you develop it? I would say it should be in those forests in Nicaragua and Honduras. That's what you need to keep because that is what the network hinges on. And likewise, when we look at this extent of deforestation, we can see that these different, uh, differing wintering regions vary quite extensively in their history of forest loss. So if you go to Costa Rica down here, Costa Rica has a relatively small amount of forest because it's a small country. But in fact, they've actually gained forest cover over the last 20 years. That's plus 1.5%. A tiny gain, you know, but still, it's there. They've been, they've been holding their own in terms of forest cover. But the one region that depends on Costa Rica is still declining. That's because some of these birds, we believe, are come originating from other regions that are being deforested. Similarly, uh, the central eastern one, we can say, well, this is the situation now, minus 0.8% per year. They're doing well, perhaps because this square is big, but in the last 20 years, these countries have cut down 29% of their forest. There's no sign that that's going to slow down. And so we should be able to take our model, if we can get one working, and say, well, what's it going to look like 20 years from now? If you take away another 29% of this forest, what will these circles look like? How will it impact wood thrush populations? Which regions are going to show the strongest declines and by how much? And that's what our goal is, is to develop a predictive model so we can do different scenarios about how, what happens when you take down forest from different areas and how is that going to show up on the breeding grounds.
We're going to switch gears a little bit and, and talk about the purple martins. Um, the wood thrush study is, is, uh, is still uh, a work in progress in terms of the modeling. Uh, we are getting more geolocators back in Ontario this summer and Nicaragua next fall, as well as a collaborator who put them on in Indiana. So we, sh we should be able to finish our map and get our model working and put the whole package together um, in the next few months, we think. The purple martins is a whole different system. So it's kind of neat, not just to be able to do this on one species, but to be able to do it on a completely different kind of migratory songbird uh, and see what the different patterns are. We could be testing hypotheses, but uh, I think to some extent this migration tracking is so new uh, that we're still in the, in the stage of developing the hypotheses in the first place. So purple martins nest in birdhouses. Uh, in eastern North America, they pretty much only use birdhouses. They've given up the habit of, of living in rock crevices and under boulders and, and tree cavities. They like the birdhouses, and that's about the only way you can get them to settle. And we've done the migration tracking uh, on an increasing large scale with these purple martins, and you can get the same kinds of data as I showed you for the wood thrush. Uh, these guys overwinter in South America. We didn't really know exactly where, but we had an idea. Uh, and here, just here's an example of one bird's uh, track. These guys uh, go impressively fast. This bird left on the 31st of August, again from our study site in Pennsylvania. Um, and in terms of uh, migration speed and such, I'm talking about uh, that element tomorrow in, in biology. Uh, but look what this bird does. 31st of August, by the 5th of September, it's in the Yucatan. So less than a week to go about 2,500 kilometers. Uh, it's really impressive how fast these guys can go when they, when they want to. That, that blew us away. Uh, they, but they overwinter down here uh, along the Amazon River in, in the Amazon Basin. So again, this bird was down here for about six months and on its uh, breeding territory for only four months. Again, they're more tropical birds really than they are uh, temperate zone birds in the sense that they spend six months of the year living in the Amazon rainforest. What did we know about purple martin connectivity before we had geolocators? Uh, well, this is an example where we actually had a lot of band returns available to us. Uh, at least 23 since 1960 of a bird banded on the breeding grounds and recovered in the tropics. And so we have a lot to work with. Uh, and what it suggests is that the birds from the east are indeed in the Amazon basin. And we just have a few examples of birds uh, going down here to southern Brazil, which is this whole area of Brazil is heavily deforested. Uh, this bird nine, I think, tracks back up here to Oregon. I can't see very well. It's one of these birds up here. So the hint, the hint that the western and the eastern ones are doing something different, the western birds are a different subspecies along the coast uh, as opposed to all these ones that are the eastern subspecies. Oh, and then I would also point out, in some cases, you, know, you get b returns in the tropics that aren't even on the winter territories at all. So not all of these are like real connectivity data, because obviously I don't think this bird overwintered here in El Salvador. It's a, a very unlikely. Uh, the other d uh, thing that we can get from our migration tracking, which you can't get from these band returns, as I said, is sort of more accurate mapping of what is the winter region that the bird uses the most. As it turns out with purple martins, they feature another type of migration called intratropical migration, which is something that we wouldn't be able to tell with band returns or even banding, and that is that individuals will move locations within the winter season. So here's an example uh, of a bird that went down to this uh, area in Brazil. It arrived the 10th of October. It stayed at this root site for a period, then went down here near Bolivia and stayed at that root site for a period, then came up here to a third root site, and then finally left on the 5th of April. And so we know these birds move around a great deal on their wintering grounds, and in terms of mapping connectivity, what we probably should choose is the site where they spend the most time. So uh, we know we found so far that 64% of the martins shift roost locations during the winter, so they have intratropical migration. And we're currently working on, on trying to test hypotheses for why individuals should be shifting roost sites. Are they following uh, patterns of rainfall? They're aerial insectivores. They don't do very well in heavy, prolonged downpours of, and long periods of rain. It may be that we can map these movements out according to rainfall patterns. Anyways, the average distance moved between the first and the second roost is 800 kilometers. We're not talking, you know, going, going across the river to a new roost site. These are actual migration movements that we see. 
So what we found uh, in the purple martens here is really the opposite pattern of what we found in wood thrush. So in wood thrush, if you remember, they have the same migration routes, but they end up in different destinations. With purple martens, we have different migration routes, but they all end up in the same place. So what we did here, we did some tracking. Uh, here again, northwestern Pennsylvania, that's our study population. We have a collaborator in coastal Virginia, a collaborator in coastal Texas, and one in coastal British Columbia. So we're trying to do like the coast-to-coast -coast thing, expecting that if you track birds, especially in eastern North America, from these widely separated breeding populations, surely, like the wood thrush, they're going to end up in different places. And that's what we're expecting to find. And then once you know where those different places are, you can relate the winter habitat loss to the breeding bird survey declines that have been measured. But no, if you look uh, at where we're mapping these out, red is Pennsylvania, green Virginia, blue is Texas, these guys are all side by side. Even the ones that go down near Bolivia, we have an example of one from each of the breeding colonies overwintering in practically the same place. Now we don't know if they're literally roosting in the same trees together. The geolocators don't have that resolution. We just know that they're in the same region. The ones that kind of stick out as oddballs are the ones from British Columbia that go down here to southeastern Brazil. This isn't just north of Rio de Janeiro. This is all deforested. I mean, this is heavily agriculture. There is no rainforest left there at all. So these, interestingly enough, the the British Columbia birds, which are probably more wild in terms of how they behave on the breeding grounds because they're in individual cavities, they still use tree snags in the west. The sort of wild breeding martens end up going to the, the city locations and our kind of backyard martens end up, strangely enough, being wild Amazon rainforest birds all winter. Not really what we expected. And in terms of connectivity, you can see the migration routes, the eastern birds use the Florida route. Our birds from Pennsylvania cross the Gulf. The Texas birds go overland and interestingly make a detour up here to the Yucatan. That seems to be the hot spot for their fall stopover. All three of these populations, although they have different migration routes, they do converge on the Yucatan uh, as a major stopover location before continuing on to Brazil. Uh, yeah, and as I said, complete mixing on the wintering grounds, even though you have, you know, Texas and Pennsylvania, so however many 2,000-something kilometers apart, they're practically side by side on the wintering grounds. So as we've, we're trying to do with a wood thrush, we can do the same thing with the purple martens. What implications does this have for population declines? And just like for the wood thrush, we can go to the breeding bird survey data and get continent-wide maps uh, of abundance which is shown here, you can see that the northern distribution of purple martens are the ones that occur at lowest abundance. Purple martens are most abundant in the south. And when we look at the population trends from the breeding bird survey, we can see in red, these are the declining populations, blue are the increasing ones, and the obvious pattern in eastern North America is that the northern populations are all in a tailspin. And you can see this looking state by state. It's true in Ontario, New York State, Pennsylvania. Purple martens are essentially disappearing from the northern part of the range. So no, we knew this before we started our study, and we had been expecting that these northern birds would be maybe doing a leapfrog pattern, and maybe they were overwintering in the cities in southern Brazil, where I've seen them. They form huge roosts at night in the middle of cities, in the parks. You have 50, 60,000 martens in the trees with the bus station and the apartment buildings and taxi cab stands all surrounding them. And maybe those areas are really poor places to overwinter, or maybe the agricultural matrix in which these cities are set expose these birds to pesticides. So we're just assuming that the connect, well, we weren't assuming, we were hoping that the connectivity pattern would tell us something about why these northern birds are doing so very poorly. But they all actually are going to the Brazilian Amazon. So even though Virginia and Texas are doing really well, and Pennsylvania is doing poorly, they share this wintering area down here. So presumably it's not habitat loss on the wintering grounds or exposure to pesticides on the wintering grounds. It explains the differences in the trends that we see. So what's next for the purple martin? Well, we've expanded the study to try to get a better handle on how migration route and stopovers 
are potentially predicting uh, breeding bird trends, as I said. So last year we deployed geolocators on three new breeding sites shown in yellow in the, in the northern part of the range here in uh, New Jersey, uh, Minnesota, and South Dakota. And then this year, Alberta, the Camrose folks are going to be putting some on. Uh, and then we have uh, sort of a, an outlier here, South Carolina. I'm more interested in the northern birds, but she wanted to do it. And we said, okay, it'll be interesting to see what the southern birds are doing. So last year we put on about 200 geolocators at five sites. Expect to get, hopefully, fingers crossed, maybe half of them back if we're lucky. Uh, and then this year doing the same kind of thing. So the big question is, we know it's not the wintering grounds because we expect all of these populations, even Alberta, we expect all of these populations to share that same wintering area, right? But they have different migration routes and different threats on migration. And maybe that is one of the reasons why we see these differences in terms of the breeding bird survey trends. The other question that we're looking at with these northern populations is whether or not uh, individuals can advance their migration in response to climate change. Let me see, I didn't put that on there. Um, so right now, this time of year, in you know, late-ish March or something like that, is what the 23rd, I think it is today? Lost track. Um, we know from our geolocator tracking that on this day, our birds are usually still in Brazil. The northern birds are still in Brazil. Back in Toronto today, it's 26 degrees. Right? So they're having the warmest winter on record, the warmest March on record. They're blowing all the records out of the water in terms of you know, hottest day ever. And yet those purple martins that are going to be coming to those areas to breed are still down in Brazil, we think. But we'll find out when they left. And so, that's the, so it may be that it's not the stopover locations at all that predict which areas are declining. It may be tied into climate change and that the northern populations are the ones that are least able to advance their migration and get back earlier to take advantage of the flush of food that comes in these earlier springs. But I'll, I'll be talking a little bit more about that tomorrow in Biological Sciences uh, Seminar. So to wrap up, I just want to uh, thank the army of undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs, who, and collaborators who have done these projects. We have uh, you know, dozens of people that have helped us with this, so it's not really fair for me to stand up and, and take credit for it all. Uh, these are a couple of my students, um, Callie and Maggie, who are um, at that location at La Selva in Costa Rica. They have a wood thrush in their hand, and they're downloading the data onto the computer uh, with, the, with the geolocator still on the bird's back. So there's Kelly downloading. So the, this is the team that you know slogs around in the rainforest getting you know bitten by bugs and watching out for snakes and getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning, getting muddy and wet and sweaty. Uh, this is the wood thrush team, just a couple of them. And then down here is the purple martin team that uh, spend their summers in shorts and flip-flops and picnic tables and backyards. <laughs> so you can see the contrast between the two kind of systems, and there's always a bit of a competition, one-upmanship in terms of these, these two groups. Uh, this system is really appealing because you can have so many collaborators helping. It's very efficient time and um, cost efficient, and I can even rope my kids here into coming and help. If I pay them, <coughs> they will come and help put geolocators on for us. And of course, many different funding agencies uh, have helped pay for the field expenses as well as the, the cost of the geolocators. I'd be happy to take questions. The wood thrush uh, going south to the, micro, to the uh, overwintering place, that um, regardless of where they left in the north, they all left at the same time. Um, they don't leave. I, we don't. This is a bit of an issue. We know that they enter the tropics at the same time. Okay. And this is a this is a sort of an issue that I dodged just a little bit. These geolocators have another sort of Achilles heel, and that is the fall and spring equinox. We just had our spring equinox well, just a couple days ago, right? Uh, during the fall and spring equinox, day length anywhere on the planet is 12 hours. That's what it means. And so if you're trying to measure latitude by day length, you have this really annoying blackout period which coincides for many populations with their migration period where you know the longitude but you don't know the latitude. And so for many of our wood thrush, all I can say is I know that they left sometime after the 5th of September, but we don't, if they go due south, we, we don't pick them up again until the 10th of October, and we, we don't really know 
when they left for sure. Okay. So, so, but we know when they enter the tropics. So it's quite likely that, that uh, the Vermont birds perhaps leave their breeding territories later. But yeah, the well, fall might... surprises me. I would think that the northern ones where it's colder would leave earlier and the southern I don't ones think so. They, they all seem to leave. I and mean, as far as we can tell, they all sort of bail out at the same time in, yeah, in early October. Wood thrush rely heavily on fruit. That may give them an advantage over some other species. Their migration is a bit later than some of the warblers. And it may be there's just so much fruit available in the temperate zone in late August, early September, that they do really well. And they can sort of, and they're larger bodied, they may be able to hang in there a bit later than, than a small warbler. But yeah, that was a bit of a surprise. I sort of assumed that we would show this nice pattern that the southeastern birds get to Belize first, and then the, these ones get to Nicaragua, and then finally the poor Vermont birds, you know, are forced with going all the way down. Like, no, that's not a period. Um, I was just wondering if you have any thoughts or <coughs> comments about how breeding site fidelity might influence your your thoughts on connectivity. Um, I've just gotten interested in this because in Canada with burrowing owls, we've put in a lot of we've put a lot of geolocators on, and we've only been able to track a few migration routes. But in there, in uh, Oregon and Washington, they've gotten something like 30% um, you know, return mm. rates, whereas we're getting more like. Yeah, the, the return rates can vary between populations. So we see that in the wood thrush, our return rate on the breeding grounds is about 25%, 30% for the males, maybe 40% even. Let's say 40% for the males and only 15% for the females. It's because the females tend to scatter more. You know, they'll, they move around from summer to summer. They're not very faithful to their mate or to their, or to their territory. Um, and by the same token, on the wintering grounds, our return rate there is only about 20%. It's equal male and female in that case, but it's only about 20%. Again, they're not as site faithful, and the areas we're working are just loaded with wood thrush. I mean, all these wood thrush from the breeding grounds have to cram into this tiny wintering region, mm -hmm. and the densities are quite high. Uh, we had one case uh, where my students were working in Belize for about a month this fall, and then they had the banding crew do some of their banding, uh, you know, mossy banding routines. And they got a bird in uh, late February that we know now from the geolocator, that bird had been in the region ever since November. But with all the nets and the hundreds of wood thrush they caught, they hadn't caught that bird yet, you yeah. see? Um, so we, so um, I think ideally to get around that problem, what we need is, a, is more like satellite telemetry for these small birds. And uh, there is a group working on putting a receiver up on the International Space Station, <laughs> for real. And so in a couple of years, they're planning to launch in 2014. And that would allow researchers on any kind of animal to be able to track your animals 24-7. Um, it does you wouldn't have to get them back. You know, if the, bird, if the animal died, you would know where it died and this sort of thing. So it's supposed but to be like the next you, big revolution in migration. Training. When you look at that subset that only return you know, fairly close to probably where that was put on. Does that have any influence when, in certain situations, there are probably lots of birds that, that might move quite far right. away from them? Yeah, I mean, we, we have two, two issues. It's not a random sample because, right. first of all, you can only get the geolocator if the bird the individual comes back to that area and you catch it. And so if individuals are going farther away, we don't really know you know, what their migration routes were, and et cetera, or what their connectivity was. A bird might breed in one place, decide to go to Belize, and then go back to the southeast to breed, for instance. And we would never know that. Uh, we also can only study the survivors. So you know, like real ecologists want to know mortality. Why are these birds dying? Where are they dying? What are the causes of mortality? Well, we can only get data from birds that live. So who's making the mistakes? I mean, what happens to birds when they, if they make mistakes or encounter problems along the way? So we may find that our migration routes are all similar because the only birds that survive are the ones that do that. The birds that cross the Gulf of Mexico in the fall, maybe they don't make it so well. And so that's why we think that they all go down through Florida, or the survivors go down through Florida. So that's why, that's why we need to be able to track birds uh, without having to catch them again. Is that just Last question. question. Uh, I'm curious about the uh, logjam on the Yucatan with the purple martins. Mm. Does that logjam occur uh, 
over time as well? Are they there at the same time? The, and, well, and also, what to, might you use to explain the fact that they jog up a couple? Of yeah, that's amazing that the Texas birds jog up. I think that I think the two parts of the question: Why do the eastern purple martins converge on the Yucatan? It's not at the same time. Okay, the, unlike the, the wood thrush, where they all enter the tropics at the same time, in purple martins, they're staggered. So the Texas birds will be in the Yucatan in July, and the Pennsylvania birds will be in the Yucatan in September. And so, you know, if there's some flush of food or something like that, there would have to be a very long food flush to support a three-month kind of a period where the different populations are coming in at different times. Um, and then why do the Texas birds jog up? It's possible that that's kind of like the wheat ear example, that the historical migration pattern has always been to have a long stop over in the Yucatan. And as the purple martin population spreads within the east, everybody goes back and does what they were always, you know, what they're sort of pre-programmed to do, so to speak. But again, we, we don't know that for sure. The British Columbia birds didn't go there, which is interesting. In, in addition, uh, she's a prolific writer. In addition to all the scientific publications. She will be signing her books on Saturday at the uh, Wild Bird General Store on 99th Street and 47th Avenue. Uh, one of her book, the 2007 book, this one, The Silence of the Bird, was a finalist for the Governor General's Literary Award. Okay, therefore, she will be signing two books. The other one is called The Bird Detective. 